The Lydian infantry was the backbone of the Great Lydian Empire. Despite being a fairly well-known empire, we know very little about the Lydians. What we do know is based on rumour and a tiny bit of archaeology. This isn't particularly helped by the fact that a majority of the archaeology aimed at discovering more about the Lydians seems to be primarily focused on one place, the empire's capital, Sardis. Despite this, we can take an educated guess on the Lydian infantry thanks to what we can piece together. There is a problem with recreating the Lydian infantry thanks to the fact that there is a very clear influence of the Lydians by the Greeks. A large portion of the Lydian Empire was made up of refugee Greeks. These Greeks spoke a dialect called Ionian, so the region they inhabited became known as Ionia. These Greeks were highly influential basically Greekifying the Lydian kings to the point where they eventually even took Greek religion seriously. As a result, historians largely think it was these Ionian Greeks that influenced the Lydian armies, especially when it came to armour. However, Herodotus throws a spanner into the mix. Herodotus claims that most, if not all, of the Greek military panoply was invented by a group of people called the Carians. The Carians are believed, or at least claimed to be, descendants of the refugees of the fallen Minoan civilization. This is a little bit sketchy because the Carians talked in a native Anatolian language. Either way, Herodotus claims it was the Carians who invented most of the Greek panoply. Specifically, the Carians are known to have figured out how to make crests for helmets, as well as non-leather hand grips for shields. Using the Carians as the source for the Lydians' armour works when you consider the fact just how close the Carians and the Lydians were, geographically speaking. These two peoples are practically neighbours. It therefore makes sense that the Lydians got their armour ideas from copying their neighbours rather than conquering a people and then adopting their armour. Arms and armour. In terms of armour, the Lydians seem to have worn a type of body armour called a bell cuirass. It's named after its distinctive shape, which resembles a bell and its primary purpose was to protect the chest and abdomen of the wearer from enemy attacks. The bell cuirass was typically made of bronze or iron, and it's consistent of two parts, the breastplate and the backplate. The breastplate was curved to fit the contours of the chest, and it was often decorated with intricate designs or inscriptions. The backplate was similarly shaped and designed to cover the back of the wearer. The bell cuirass was an important piece of armour for ancient soldiers as it protected some of the most vulnerable parts of the body. It was typically worn over a leather tunic or other protective clothing and could be fastened in place with straps or buckles. Despite its effectiveness, the bell cuirass was not without its drawbacks. It was cumbersome to wear which could make it difficult for soldiers to move quickly or engage in close combat. Additionally, it was expensive to produce, which meant that it was often reserved for use by wealthy or elite soldiers. Now, unlike the Greeks, the Lydians wore a rather unique helmet. Although, for some reason, the helmet they used has no name. However, We do know that the type of helmet used by the Lydians was a type of Spangenhelm. Which is interesting as this type of helmet was more popular in medieval times than in ancient times. The Spangenhelm was made of several metal plates that were riveted together and it typically featured a nose guard, cheek guards and a neck guard for additional protection. The name Spangenhelm comes from the German words Spangen meaning metal strips, and helm, meaning helmet. 
The helmet was constructed by riveting narrow metal strips together to form a frame, and then attaching metal plates to the frame to create a protective shell. The metal plates were often decorated with intricate designs, such as embossed patterns or etched figures. Now in terms of defence, the Lydians seem to have used the Aspis Hoplon shield. This was another Greek item adopted by the Lydians. The Aspis Hoplon shield was a large round shield used by ancient Greek soldiers known as hoplites. The Aspis Hoplon shield was made of wood and was typically covered in a layer of bronze or leather. It measured around 3 feet in diameter and was designed to cover a hoplite's entire body. The Aspis Hoplon shield was an essential part of the hoplite's armour and it played a crucial role in the phalanx formation. The phalanx formation was a military tactic in which hoplites would form a tight interlocking formation with their shields overlapping. This formation was virtually impenetrable and allowed the hoplites to move forward as a unified force. The hoplon shield was not only a defensive weapon, but a deadly offensive weapon. The shield had a sharp metal boss in the centre, which could be used to deliver crushing blows to the enemy. The hoplon shield was not just a piece of equipment, it was a symbol of the hoplite's status and honour. The shields were often decorated with intricate designs and patterns, which were unique to each hoplite. These designs ranged from simple geometric patterns to complex mythological scenes. The designs were often painted onto the shield in bright colours, and some shields were even covered in gold leaf. The decorations on the hoplon shield were not just for show, they served to inspire and motivate the hoplites in battle reminding them of their duty and their allegiance to their city-state. For weapons, we can guess that the primary weapon of the Lydian infantry was the spear. The Lydian spears were the primary weapon used by the ancient Lydian soldiers, who were known for their military prowess and played a significant role in the conflicts of the ancient Near East. These spears were long, slender and lightweight making them ideal for thrusting attacks. They were typically made of durable material, such as bronze or iron, and had a sharp point at the end. The Lydian spears were typically around 6 to 8 feet long, which allowed the soldiers to attack from a distance, keeping the enemy at bay. The shaft of the spears were made of wood, which made them lightweight and easy to handle. The spearhead was made of metal, and was designed to penetrate armour and inflict maximum damage. The spearheads were usually around 9 to 12 inches long and were either pointed or leaf shaped. One of the most distinctive features of the Lydian spears was the way they were designed to be held. The Lydian soldiers were known for their exceptional skill with the spear and their battle formations were designed to make the most of this weapon. However, what's more interesting is the fact that the Lydians used a weird type of sickle sword and were known for their innovative and unconventional approach to warfare. The sword was named for its distinct shape, which resembled a sickle or a crescent moon. This shape allowed for a wider cutting edge, making the sword more effective in close combat. The sickle sword was typically made of bronze or iron, and measured around 2 to 3 feet in length. The sickle sword was primarily a slashing weapon, and its curved blade made it ideal for delivering powerful blows that could cause severe injuries. The sword's unique shape also allowed for greater manoeuvrability, making it ideal for its use in tight spaces and close combat. The Lydian soldiers were also known for their skill in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the sickle sword was an important part of their arsenal. One of the most significant advantages of the sickle sword was its versatility. The sword could be used for a range of purposes, from combat to agriculture. The curved blade made it an ideal tool for harvesting crops, and some sickle swords even had wooden handles that could be used to attach the sword to a long pole 
creating a makeshift scythe. The sickle sword was not without its drawbacks, however. The curved blade made it more challenging to penetrate armour, and the sword was not as effective as a thrusting weapon. Despite these limitations, the Lydian soldiers continued to use the sickle sword as a primary weapon, and it remained an integral part of their military strategy. In battle. With all things Lydian, we can't say for certain how the Lydian infantry fought. Despite the lack of direct evidence, scholars have attempted to reconstruct their battle tactics based on historical accounts and archaeological findings. One common theory is that the Lydians fought in a shield wall formation, similar to the tactics used by other ancient armies. A shield wall formation involves soldiers standing shoulder to shoulder, with their shields overlapping to create a solid barrier. This formation provided excellent protection against missile weapons, and the soldiers within the formation could advance slowly and steadily towards their enemies. Once they reached the enemy, the soldiers would use their weapons, such as spears or swords, to make thrusting attacks over the top of the shields. While there is no direct evidence to support the idea that the Lydians fought in a shield wall formation, there are indications that they used similar tactics. Ancient accounts suggest that the Lydians were highly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they placed a great deal of emphasis on their shields. In addition, archaeological evidence suggests that the Lydians used similar shield designs to other armies that employed the shield wall tactic. In conclusion, while we may never know exactly how the ancient Lydians fought, they likely used tactics similar to other ancient armies. The shield wall formation was a common tactic in ancient warfare, and there are indications that the Lydians used similar tactics. While the specifics on their battle formations may remain a mystery, the Lydians' military prowess and innovative approach to warfare have left an enduring legacy in the ancient world. Thank you for watching and listening to our videos. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe if you've enjoyed. Or, if you really like the channel, consider supporting us on Patreon. There, for as little as $1 a month, you'll gain access to an ever-expanding variety of exclusive Ancient History Guy content not found anywhere else online. All donations go directly back into the channel, helping us on our campaign to conquer YouTube. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. I've been the Ancient History Guy, and as always, I'll be seeing you later.